Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Grand Rounds. It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Daniela Kadian Dodov. She is an associate professor of medicine at the ICANN School of Medicine at Mount Sinai in the sections of vascular medicine and the vascular diagnostic laboratory in the Zena and Michael A. Wiener in Cardiovascular Institute in the Mount Sinai Fuster Heart Hospital. She began her training in vascular medicine during a time of renewed interest in fibromuscular dysplasia as the data registry um, as the data from the U.S. Registry for FMD was becoming available and helped identify a very high rate of aneurysm and dissection in FMD patients. Now the overlap between spontaneous coronary artery dissection and cervical artery dissection with FMD are robust areas of international research. She has additional publications in basic science research regarding the behavior of vascular endothelial cells and clinical research investigating the diagnostic role of vascular ultrasound. Dr. Kadian Dodov is an active educator for internal medicine house staff and cardiology fellows and is the program director for the Vascular Medicine Fellowship at Mount Sinai. For her outstanding teaching and contributions to the Cardiovascular Fellowship, she was awarded the Simon Dack Award in 2023. She is also the current images section editor for the Vascular Medicine Journal, the premier US academic publication for vascular medicine. She is also a board of, trust, a board of trustee for the Society of Vascular Medicine and a board member of the CLI Global Society, a nonprofit committed to reducing worldwide amputations and death related to peripheral artery disease. Please join me in welcoming her for Grand Rounds. Good morning, everybody. It's a, a real honor for me to be here. Um, and I, I'm just excited to spend the morning with you. So we're going to get right into it with PAD, an epidemic of medical neglect. And you'll hopefully walk away understanding um, how you can really make a difference for your patients. Um, so these are my disclosures. None of them are really relevant to today. The the work that I do with Boston Scientific and Abbott Laboratories really involves uh, medical educational conferences. Um, so in terms of the objectives for this talk, first, um, by the end, I hope you'll be able to utilize appropriate diagnostic testing to identify and treat patients with PAD, and second, apply best medical therapy to reduce mortality and limb events in patients with PAD. So we'll start with a case. This was a 78-year-old woman with leg pain who was referred to me. Uh, she's a vasculopath. She has CAD, hypertension, COPD, and she's a current smoker. She was complaining of bilateral cramping pain, left more than right when she ambulated any distance. She had leg pain at night sometimes and a sensation of numbness and tingling that radiated from the hip to the foot. Her meds are listed there for you, but I want to call out she was on aspirin, atorvastatin 40 milligrams, and losartan 25 milligrams daily. So her um, primary care provider got a lower extremity arterial duplex. And as you can see on the right, there was no significant stenosis noted. And on the left, she had a 20 to 49% stenosis in the distal SFA with some plaque visualized, but really no other major um, obstruction to flow. So the question is, does this explain our patient's leg pain? And how do you distinguish causes of leg pain for your patient? What diagnostic test is gonna be most appropriate to help you identify whether or not PAD, for example, is the cause of the patient's leg pain? So like most things, we start with the history, right? So PAD traditionally is described as exertional and reproducible pain, that's intermittent claudication, and it resolves with rest in less than 10 minutes. Spinal stenosis is the great mimicker, um, and for that reason, pain related to it is called pseudoclaudication. It can be exertional or positional, often with just standing alone, and it's not relieved by rest alone often. Patients will need to sit down, lie down, lean forward to relieve their pain. Lumbar disc herniation is worse with exertion, um, but tends to linger after rest with some relief after lying down. Osteoarthritis is a uh, pain that can radiate, is variable in its onset, and it's not relieved by rest honest, uh, often. And then venous claudication, which most people don't think about, um, is described as an exertional tightness or bursting pain as the patient has inflow into the limb and not enough outflow, you get almost like a, an elevation in compartment pressure that causes pain. And this subsides after lengthy rest. It often takes over 15 minutes to go away. <clears throat> 
Beyond that, PAD has a real spectrum of disease. So up to 20% or so may be asymptomatic. Only about 30% in the literature present with that typical claudication pain. A lot of patients have these atypical symptoms that don't fit the illness script. And then about 10% or so will present with chronic limb-threatening ischemia, the end stage, which is rest pain, gangrene, or ulceration. And this is extremely um, high risk, as we'll talk about, because 25% will ultimately require an amputation within a year. Now, the other thing to consider is the level of involvement, which is going to really dictate your patient's presentation. So you can see on the right-hand side of the slide the frequency of involvement doesn't add up to 100% because patients can have multi-level disease. And on the left-hand side, the location of disease. So you typically will have symptoms one level below where the obstruction is. Um, and then the symptoms will depend a lot on collateral flow. So in the artoiliac regions, collaterals are typically pretty well developed. But if patients do have significant symptoms, um, the revascularization op options have very high patency rates. Um, down in the femoral popliteal region, the profunda is the great collateral, and that will dictate the patient's presentation a lot. And our patency rates for revascularization are lower than the ortoiliac, but better than below the knee. Below the knee are typically the area where we have our diabetic CKD patients with disease. There's very low patency rates in this area. Patients will present with calf or foot claudication or pain. Let me hold on. Um, so how do we determine whether or not a patient's limb is getting enough perfusion overall, taking into account all this collateral flow? Well, the ankle brachial index is the cornerstone of diagnosis for PAD because it's going to tell you about the right. overall so perfusion to, mail, to the foot, since I can't taking do into it account the all bank, that collateral flow. You're not... And the way that we um, calculate that is we take the highest ankle systolic pressure between the dorsalis pedis or posterior tibial over the highest brachial pressure between the right or left arm. And we do that for each leg. Um, we use a Doppler sensor to see exactly when flow comes in um, after we occlude with the cuff. And when you look at the sensitivity and the specificity, the ABI I I did that, no? um, outperforms the pulse exam and the ROSE questionnaire, which is symptoms of claudication, um, reproducibly. So it is the best um, tool well, that we have for the out. diagnosis of PAD. No. Now, how well do not in internists office. do at um, screening and diagnosing so if patients I do with it, PAD? Well, there isn't a lot of I'm data out there, but there is this study um, from 2013 published in the Vascular Medicine I'm, Journal. I'm in, it was uh, I'm in it included now. or invited over a thousand GPs in Australia to participate in a survey about their practices. Can we let it go? About 26% well, responded. I, and the majority you um, you know, we'll used the history and examination, day. followed by the ABI and duplex ultrasound. But when, pa when providers um, felt that the patient's history and physical That's exam was correct. consistent with PAD, yes. the majority would go to duplex as a first-line diagnostic okay. tool. All right. And usually this was because of lack of time, training, or skills okay. um, in, in their practice. The Good younger enough. GPs under age 40 were more likely to use the ABI right. over Thanks. duplex, um, probably because of improvement in our education and um, getting, getting providers ready to care for these patients. But when you think about the available diagnostic testing in PAD, again, the physiologic testing, the ankle brachial index, and we're going to talk about the other um, additions to the ABI, really tells you if there's an arterial flow problem for your patient. The imaging is going to allow you to see the lesion anatomically, but it's not going to tell you if it's responsible for your patient's symptoms. So when you're thinking about physiologic versus imaging testing, either ABI or imaging will tell you if your patient has PAD. It'll identify plaque in the limb. If you wanna know where it's located, imaging is probably gonna be better than physiologic testing. But if you wanna know how it relates to your patient's presentation, physiologic testing alone will tell you that. When we consider therapeutic options, the imaging is gonna outperform physiologic testing. And we're thinking about whether or not our patients actually improved from the therapy we gave them, the physiologic testing will tell us that. So again, coming back to the ABI, um, the threshold for abnormal is an ABI of 0.9. Borderline is considered up to 1. one uh, normal is 1 to 1.4. And then in patients with calcific disease, diabetics, and stage renal disease, when the ABI is greater than 
we have the ABI is no longer accurate. And we have some other tools that we can use in that setting. But I want to spend just a moment to use this as an example of calculating an ABI. So we have a right brachial pressure of 160, left of 120. We said we're going to take the higher of the two, and this nicely illustrates why. We have a pretty big gradient between these two limbs. There's left subclavian axillary disease, okay, because there's a difference of more than 20 millimeters of mercury between the right and left arms. So that's why we take the higher brachial pressure always when we do this. Um, and then if we go to the right leg, the higher of the ankle pressures is 80 from the dorsalis pedis. So our ABI on the right, 80 over 160, is 0.5, which is abnormal. On the left, the higher ankle pressure is 120. 120 over 160 is 0.75, which is also abnormal. And the reason we use the higher between the ankle pressures is because it's the most specific for the presence of disease. Now, there are some inherent limitations to just an ABI. It doesn't localize the level of disease, number one, right? It tells you there's a blockage somewhere between the arm and the ankle, but not much more. How do we get around that? Well, we can get segmental pressures. We can get multi-level pressures to help identify the level of disease. And I'll show you an example of that. What about variability between exams? At what point can we say a patient's actually getting worse or better? Well, you're looking for a change of 0.15 or more, and that's considered significant between exams. What about this calcification and non-compressibility that I mentioned for our diabetics and end-stage renal disease patients or when the ABI is greater than 1.4? We can actually obtain the toe brachial index, which uses the great toe pressure versus the brachial pressure, um, and abnormal is less than 0.7 in that setting. And then what about our patients with mild disease? There's probably poor sensitivity in that, right? If it's normal at rest, does it really mean they don't have PED? Well, just like cardiac testing, you can do exercise testing to bring out disease if the resting ABI is normal and actually see if you can reproduce their symptoms of claudication. So this is an example of what segmental pressures look like. Um, essentially, most institutions will use this three cuff method, which is a thigh cuff, below knee, and then ankle. And it's paired with a continuous wave Doppler, which is taken at the level of the groin. And you can see the continuous wave Doppler waveform at the bottom. Um, so to identify the level of disease, you first calculate the ABI, and after you determine it's abnormal, you look for a drop in the pressure of 20 to determine the level of disease. So using this as an example, the higher brachial pressure, 146 on the left, is compared to 125 on the right. So we're going to use 146. And of the two gives us an ABI of 0.87, which is abnormal. On the left-hand side, the higher of the ankle pressures gives us, gives us an ABI of 0.83, which is also abnormal. So now we want to find the level. If we go from 146 to 143 in the right thigh, we're still within 20 to 114. There's our drop. And it doesn't have a further drop after that. We see the same level of drop on the left side. So this patient has bilateral femoral popliteal artery disease. Okay. So now you see waveforms on the side here as well. These are pulse volume waveforms. So the cuff when you do an ABI is partially inflated and it's measuring the volume displacement of blood flow. That mirrors this, um, the continuous wave Doppler with the triphasic waveform. So a normal waveform should have an upstroke dichrotic notch and be triphasic as shown here. The first thing to go in the presence of disease is the dichrotic notch. Then it becomes parvus tardis and then very abnormal. So it's an adjunct to the pressure, but the pressure is always more accurate than the waveforms. Okay, this is the last ABI example to, to show you for exercise therapy. Um, so in this case, we've got an, a brachial pressure on the right of 140, which is the higher of the two. Our ABI at rest on the right is 0.9, the highest uh, ABI, which is just abnormal. On the left side, we have a big discrepancy, 1.24 for the posterior tibial versus 0.66. Pretty big difference there, right? So this patient happened to have CKD and diabetes, so we obtained the toe brachial index. We took the great toe pressure and the brachial pressure, and both of these toe brachial indices are less than 0 0.7, 0 0.51 and 0.38. So what's happening here? Why is the ABI kind of close to normal, but the TBI is so abnormal? Well, with calcification, you can get a falsely normal ABI. 
okay? Because as it becomes calcified, it becomes more difficult for that, that cuff to compress it. Um, this patient was complaining of claudication, so they were exercised on a treadmill. And with exercise, the ankle pressures dropped. So on the right side, we went from 126 to 85 and 174 to 119, demonstrating that this patient has um, significant disease, limiting their ability to ambulate. And this is just a slide demonstrating that even patients with chronic limb-threatening ischemia and ulcer or wound uh, requiring revascularization, a significant number will have a falsely normal ABI because of that calcification. So if you have a patient with a wound, you get an ABI and it's normal, that may not be the end of the story. You may need to dig deeper if it doesn't fit the clinical picture. So this is the toe brachial index, um, really tiny cuff um, with photoplethysmography to identify um, the pressure and the waveform. Um, the reason this works is because the small vessels are not subject to calcification in the way that the larger vessels are. Um, so this is the tool to use when you suspect calcification or when your ABI is not normal. So coming back to the first patient that we saw who had the 20 to 49% stenosis in the left leg and symptoms uh, of pain that varied with different rates of ambulation and sometimes at nighttime, this is her ABI. So we've got an ABI that shows um, 1.08 on the right, 1.1 on the left, so both are normal at rest. Her waveforms look pretty okay. She's got a little bit of a, a dichrotic notch there, but she's reporting pain with ambulation. So she gets exercised. Um, she ended up stopping because of leg pain left more than right. But if we look at her pressures on the left, they actually went up with exercise and her ABIs after exercise remained within normal range. So her pain is not due to PAD. Although she has PAD, we actually saw a plaque on her imaging. So this is an opportunity for us to optimize medical therapy, not to go down thinking we need to treat this lesion, 20 to 49% stenosis. So what are our treatment goals for PAD? Well, they're really threefold. We want to prevent MACE, prevent MAL um, limb events, and improve symptoms of claudication for our patient. We're going to focus a lot on the first two in this talk. And this is what all the fuss is about, basically. Um, there's very, uh, a lot of reproducible data that CV risk increases with a decreasing ABI. So what you can see is non-fatal um, or fatal MI on the y-axis and your ABI shown here. Now, simply an abnormal, oops, abnormal ABI of 0.9 gets you an event rate per year of 2%. If your ABI is less than 0.7, 3.8%. So if you carry that out to five years, your risk is 10% with an abnormal ABI, almost 20% if your ABI is less than 0.7. And if you translate that into Framingham risk, which defines 20% at 10 years, every single patient with PAD is very high risk for cardiovascular events, okay? And we should be treating them appropriately. And the, the reality is we just don't do that. Um, in terms of epidemiology, the rates of PAD are rising. So as of 2010, there were more than 200 million patients around the world with PAD. And this was a significant increase in both our older and younger patients. And again, if we look at the outcomes of MACE and MAL for just a diagnosis of PAD, including asymptomatic patients, not CLTI, the rate of non-fatal stroke or MI is 15%, uh, sorry, 20%, 15% will die because of a cardiovascular event. For limb events, one to 2% will progress to CLTI and 20% will get revascularized over a five-year follow-up. It's even more dismal for patients with chronic limb-threatening ischemia, which again is gangrene, rest pain, or ulceration. Accounts for about 10% of patients overall. At one year, 50% will be alive with two limbs. 25% will be dead. The other 25% will have an amputation. So it's, it's horrible outcomes. And this was really interesting data looking at um, five-year all-cause mortality of CLTI and major amputation compared to other um, diseases. And you can see that CLTI major amputation, higher rates of mortality than all cancer. And if you look at where our healthcare dollars go in terms of research and all of that, I can tell you it's definitely not going to PAD. Um, so it's, it's a shame. 
But there's been a lot of work in advocacy on this and I'm, I'll just update you on that. Um, but I wanna pause and just comment on the disparities in PAD as well. So African-Americans have four times the amputation risk when it comes to PAD. Um, there's definitely a connection with poverty and our patients with CLTI and combined Medicare and Medicaid, they have higher mortality and amputation compared to those with Medicare alone. And then there's geographic differences, much higher rates of amputations in the Southeast Central US as compared to the mountain areas, for example, and much lower rates of amputation-free survival for our black patients. Um, so this was just released at, uh, AHA in 2023 and recently published, um, the AHA developed the National Action Plan for Peripheral Artery Disease um, to improve awareness, diagnosis, and treatment of PAD. There are six arms, public awareness, detection and treatment, research, professional education, public health and advocacy, with a goal to improve these horrible outcomes for our patients. One of the first things that this group did, which is really a coalition of major stakeholders from different professional societies, including the surgeons, medicine, cardiologists, et cetera, um, and the uh, Diabetes Association, the ADA, for example, um, is to, to try to um, implement opportunities for us to um, change policy. And so they produced this non-traumatic lower extremity amputation by congressional district heat map of the US. And you can access this online. You can look it up by county, state to see how your area is performing. And the, the hope is that this will be used to inform why some areas are doing so bad. Is it a matter of access to care? Um, what is going on to make such a big difference between the Southeast and Central US compared to the rest of the country? Um, when it comes to screening guidelines, there are things that we can be doing if we follow um, you know, what's already out there. This is uh, from the European um, Society for Cardiology, AHA and ACC, and they advocate for screening patients for PAD if you're over the age of 65, or if you're 50 to 64 with diabetes and one additional risk factor, or if you have atherosclerotic disease in another vascular bed. Um, if you're less than age 50 and you have diabetes um, and one additional risk factor, you should be screened as well. This is in direct contradiction to what was recently published by the US Preventative Services Task Force in 2018, who said that basically there's not enough evidence to say whether using the ABI to look for PAD is beneficial for adults with no symptoms. And I have a few comments on this um, because I know how important these um, publications are in terms of informing our practice. Um, so first is that during the open commentary period, there were many recommendations from multiple societies that came together in a detailed 10 page letter that was really ignored. Um, in addition, we know that PAD patients have lower functional status that may not be reported. Patients tend, and most people tend to avoid pain. So they often will limit their ambulation or lifestyle to avoid symptoms without even realizing they're doing it. And sometimes you need that objective testing to show you the patient has PAD. Almost a third of the patients that were used in this publication were authored by the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, which is the USPS um, TF mother organization, but other quality references on screening benefit were ignored or not included. They ended up um, comparing the ABI to MRA and reported poor sensitivity, but I'll take you back to the beginning of my talk. MRA is not the gold standard for diagnosis, the ABI is. So it's not really a, an appropriate comparison. We know that there's clear benefit to cardiovascular risk reduction when we use guideline recommended medical therapy for our patients with an abnormal ABI. And lastly, they said that there was a potential for harm with additional testing um, if you if you've identified PAD in a patient with no symptoms, for example. But the reality is we don't need additional testing if the patient doesn't have symptoms. You can stop at the ABI, put them on maximal medical therapy and stop there. You don't need to get additional testing. And I'll just bring you back to this. Every single patient with PAD is very high risk and should be treated appropriately. So this is a summary slide of what our guideline directed medical therapy is. We have a lot of level one evidence to support this. Um, for our antiplatelet therapy, at minimum patients should be on aspirin, or I'll make an argument for clopidogrel in our symptomatic patients later on in my talk. 
all patients should be on a statin with LDL less than 70. Very important. For our patients with hypertension, we should be targeting uh, blood pressure less than 130 over 80. And, um, and there is evidence to support the use of an ACE or an ARB in these patients. Smoking cessation should be advised. Solostazole is an effective therapy to reduce symptoms for those that can tolerate it. And then supervised exercise is recommended and now approved and paid for. And we should be referring patients for this. So um, I wanna pause and just give the diagnosis or the definition of medical negligence. And that's when a healthcare provider fails to follow recognized standards of care and causes preventable harm to the patient. And this is really is an ep epidemic in, um, in the field of medicine. Um, and here's some data to support that. So looking at NHANES data, um, the US PAD prevalence was 5.9% in 1999 to 2004, or 7.1 million adults with PAD. And what you can see is the reported statin use, ACE, ARB, and aspirin use was in the 30s. For patients who had multiple preventative therapies, there was a 65% lower all-cause mortality. So these therapies work if you use them. Now you might say, well, this is old data. I'm sure we're doing better. I wish I could tell you that was true. This is a more recent publication um, from 2017 that looked at data from the National Ambulatory Medical Care Survey and National Hospital Ambulatory Medical Care um, Survey between 2006 and 2013. And what you can see is PAD alone is the blue bar, PAD with CAD is the red bar. Patients are treated better if they have both PAD and CAD. Um, but regardless, we're still in the you know, 30s to 40s for medical care for these patients, which is really just horrific. Now, what about even our end-stage patients? We must be doing what we can for them, right? Well, this is uh, two recent chronic limb-threatening ischemia trials, best CLI and basal 2 and I pulled out the medical therapy from each of these trials. These are patients who are getting revascularized, right, for gangrene or amputated. Um, antiplatelet therapy, only about 70 to 80% at most. Lipid lowering therapy, 70s. Nobody should be getting on anybody's table if they're not on a statin. In terms of our lipid and hypertension control guidelines, again, um, we know that treatment with statin is indicated and that antihypertensive therapy should be administered with the use of an ACE or an ARB, um, which may actually reduce ischemic events. So, what statin should you be using? Really, you only should have a torvastatin 40 to 80 or resuvastatin 20 to 40 in your armamentarium, but I would just say start something. You know, 30% or not on anything. So just put your patient on any statin to start. There is some data for the PCSK9 inhibitors. Um, this was the PAD subgroup from the Furrier trial, which included over 27,000 patients. Um, they included PADs identified by intermittent claudication and a reduced ABI or prior revascularization. Um, a lot of these patients were on the maximum tolerated statin therapy, pretty good numbers as you can see there. But when you look at the outcomes of reduction in CV death MI or stroke, those with PAD had a number needed to treat of only 29. Um, so significant reduction with PCSK9 inhibitor use. Additionally, there was a reduction in MACE or MAL for these patients, number needed to treat of 25 for patients with PAD. There was no safety concerns or adverse events, and the limb benefits persisted even at very low LDL levels. So we definitely can apply these therapies to our patients to get their LDL to goal. In terms of hypertension, um, the data for ACE or ARB comes from the HOPE trial, which was a trial comparing ramipril versus placebo in patients without heart failure. 42% of the patients included in this trial had PAD. And what you can see is a reduction in almost every outcome, at least cardiovascular outcomes, um, with the use of ramipril 10 milligrams versus placebo. And so for that reason, if your patient with PAD has hypertension, I would absolutely apply ACE or ARB therapy to their um, prescription. The antiplatelet therapy guidelines are confusing. I'm gonna to try to break it down to a digestible level. Um, but essentially, the current guidelines say that it's reasonable to use antiplatelet therapy for asymptomatic PAD. You can use aspirin or clopidogrel for symptomatic PAD. The effectiveness of dual antiplatelet therapy is not really well established, um, but 
I, we will have new guidelines that are gonna be coming out later on this year that will also incorporate the new COMPASS trial data, which we'll review briefly. So going back in time, the data for aspirin versus nothing comes from the antiplatelet trialist collaboration that was published in the 90s. Um, the other high-risk group shown here were patients with PAD. The majority of antiplatelet therapy was aspirin, and it showed a 32% reduction in stroke MI or vascular death with the use of aspirin therapy. And so for that reason, at minimum, aspirin should be used. Now, for patients with symptomatic PAD, Capri supports the use of clopidogrel monotherapy. Um, this was a study of almost 20,000 patients with stroke, MI, or PAD that were followed for nearly three years. Um, and there was an overall risk reduction with clopidogrel compared to aspirin at follow-up. And it really was carried by the PAD subgroup. And so for that reason, in my practice, patients with symptomatic PAD get clopidogrel therapy. Uh, what about DAPT? Well, the CHARISMA trial um, looked at patients with PAD. This is, the again, the subtrial of patients with PAD um, who received DAPT versus only aspirin. There was no reduction in the composite endpoint, but there was a reduction in MI and hospitalizations. It came at an increased risk of bleeding. And this is a, a trend that we're going to see for these patients. Number one, most of the data for PAD comes from larger coronary trials, and we do subgroup analyses. Um, and so shown here, because um, ticagrelor had suggested some benefit in the coronary trials um, over potentially clopidogrel in the PAD subgroup, this was also became, becoming a question. So ticagrelor and aspirin versus aspirin, significant reduction in MACE with ticagrelor. Ticagrelor and aspirin versus clopidogrel and aspirin, no significant reduction in MACE at an increased risk of bleeding. So these two finally went head to head in the Euclid study, ticagrelor monotherapy versus clopidogrel, and ticagrelor was not superior. So P2Y12 inhibitor for your symptomatic patient, doesn't matter which one. That's the takeaway. So that brings us to the COMPASS trial. Um, now this was a landmark study. Um, this was a study looking at low dose rivaroxaban, 2.5 milligrams twice a day with aspirin, rivaroxaban five milligrams twice a day, or aspirin only. The PAD subgroup was about 7,500 patients. It included patients with carotid disease, as well as intermittent claudication and abnormal ABI or prior revascularization. The trial was actually stopped early because there was superiority in the low-dose rivaroxaban and aspirin group after 23 months. And what it showed was a reduction in the composite cardiovascular death stroke in MI in the low-dose rivaroxaban and aspirin group. Um, compared to aspirin alone, not significant for rivaroxaban versus aspirin. It also showed a significant reduction in major adverse limb events, 46% reduction with low-dose rivaroxaban um, and aspirin versus aspirin alone. However, again, it comes at an increased rate of bleeding, right? So ISTH major, major bleeding was increased. It's a pretty conservative bleeding definition, um, but bleeding into a critical organ was not significantly increased. Um, so finding that margin of, of benefit for your patient with increased ischemic risk versus bleeding risk becomes important for the use of this therapy. But the limb events with PAD is becoming recognized more and more as a really important um, outcome that we need to be aware of. Um, and really, after your patients have lower extremity revascularization, it represents a turning point in their disease. So it's important for your claudicants that you're careful about who you refer, and this is why. After lower extremity revascularization, it's been reproduced in multiple different studies that there's a fourfold increase of acute limb ischemia for patients. You can think of acute limb ischemia as analogous to a STEMI, but with worse outcomes, right? So really, time is muscle in both conditions. It's an acute thrombotic occlusion. Um, but the mortality after acute limb ischemia is 12% compared to 8% with a STEMI. MACE, 11.7% compared to 3.4% with a STEMI. Acute limb ischemia recurrence, 24% at one year. And amputation, nearly a third of patients. Heart failure at one year, 7.4%. Yet somehow, this doesn't get the same um, kind of bluster or attention as it does in the coronary space. And after you have acute limb ischemia, most of your events after that are limb related. 
So again, amputation rates 27% and revascularization nearly two thirds of patients. So you're committing your patient very likely to repeat procedures after they undergo um, peripheral revascularization. And this started getting a lot of attention in the lay press um, last year. Some of you may have seen this. There was a publication in the New York Times about um, patients who had undergone repeat revascularization. Now the, the content of the article focused a lot potentially on um, on bad actors in the peripheral space, um, but it, I think, did a service because it disservice because it didn't stratify patients with CLTI versus intermittent claudication. Regardless, patients we send for revascularization procedures, we need to be really thoughtful about who they are. Um, so, what is the optimal medical therapy after intervention, and how can we prevent these poor outcomes? Well, I mentioned there's no high quality data that DAPs effective. Um, we've got subgroup analyses from coronary intervention trials showing reduced ischemic risk, but it increased rates of bleeding. Charisma didn't have a statistically significant benefit. There were two very small trials for endovascular revascularization and bypass. One was stopped early due to poor enrollment. The other had no difference in adjudicated ischemic outcomes or bleeding. So we really have no data on DAPT uh, for PAD. However, if you look at the package insert for the approved devices after revascularization, the recommendations for DAPT are kind of all over the map, anywhere from one month to three months. So that brings us to the Voyager trial. Um, this study was looking at low-dose rivaroxaban with aspirin versus aspirin alone after peripheral uh, revascularization. And for the reasons I outlined, it didn't compare low-dose rivaroxaban and aspirin to DAPT, which was one of the main criticisms of the trial. Um, but these patients were um, referred. Here's the breakdown of the patients. Um, up to 50% ended up getting clopidogrel therapy on top of their assigned treatment group. Um, and it was pretty fair in terms of reasons for revascularization. About a fifth were getting revascularized for critical limb ischemia, and two thirds were endovascular. Now, what it showed was a reduction in the primary outcome of cardiovascular death, acute limb ischemia, major amputation, MI or stroke with low dose rivaroxaban and aspirin compared to aspirin only. There was a reduction in acute limb ischemia by itself, although again, it came at an increased risk of bleeding. There was no incremental benefit with the addition of clopidogrel. And they actually did a sub analysis of clopidogrel in the Voyager trial. And what you can see is the um, the CAM curves for patients with clopidogrel on top of their therapy versus without. And there was no difference in the absolute risk reduction with the use of low dose rivaroxaban and aspirin um, despite the use of clopidogrel therapy. So we shouldn't be withholding this low dose rivaroxaban therapy to our patients if they're on clopidogrel. Um, it doesn't seem to affect the outcome. And I'll talk about the added bleeding risk now. So they did look at bleeding. If you were on clopidogrel therapy for one month or less, there was no increased risk of bleeding. You could do triple therapy. After 30 days, that's when the bleeding rates went way up. So you could do aspirin, clopidogrel, low-dose rivaroxaban for a month, and then drop the clopidogrel. The reality is the interventionalists are usually the ones making these decisions, um, not us. So you have to work together with them. Um, I think the new question is gonna be like in the coronary space, should we be doing clopidogrel and low dose rivaroxaban and omit the aspirin? And maybe that will reduce the bleeding risk. Um, we have good data too that using this low dose rivaroxaban in addition to aspirin reduces first and subsequent vascular events. So you can see with each subsequent event, um, the rivaroxaban group was lower compared to placebo. So this is a nice summary that was published in Jack in 2018. I have a small modification to the treatment algorithm as shown there. But if you have a symptomatic patient, I would consider low-dose rivaroxaban with aspirin or clopidogrel monotherapy. If your patient's getting revascularized, you can do the clopidogrel on top of that low-dose rivaroxaban for up to a month and then drop the um, clopidogrel after that point, again, working together with the interventionalist. But that's what the data shows has the best outcomes. Um, so moving on to some other therapies very briefly, I just wanna call out that glycemic control can be beneficial in our patients with CLTI to reduce limb events. Um, again, there's some subgroup analyses from these trials with newer agents, including the SGLT2 inhibitors um, and the GLP-1 uh, agonists as well. Um, 
with SGLT2 inhibitors, there's a reduction in cardiovascular death in the P80 subgroup with the GLP-1 receptor agonists. Um, there was a lower rate of amputation. So um, we can absolutely apply these to our patients with PAD. So what about managing the patient with claudication and improving symptoms? Um, appropriate use of celostazole. It needs to be given as 100 milligrams twice a day, up to three to six months to reach its full effect. Um, it's important to know that up to two thirds, if the patient can tolerate it, will have an improvement in their walking outcomes, but up to two thirds don't tolerate it. And that's because of side effects of GI effects, headaches and dizziness. Um, and there's a black box warning in patients with heart failure. Exercise therapy definitely um, can improve functional status, quality of life, and reduce leg symptoms. And supervised exercise um, should be offered if you can. It's now approved. Um, it requires a face-to-face -face encounter. Um, but then you can get up to 12 weeks, three sessions a week for your patient. This is how you order it here. So it's through cardiac rehab. Um, you put in the consult to cardiac rehab in EPIC. The reason for referral, intermittent claudication, lower extremity revascularization, um, and then the patient can call for an appointment and they will get exercise therapy at Sinai. Um, so definitely something you can incorporate into your practice. Some patients can't do the in-person supervised exercise. And so this is what I will tell my patients for a home program, three to five days a week, um, up to 50 minutes. They have to walk fast enough to get that claudication pain that stops them at two blocks, stop and rest, wait for it to go away and then go again. So um, it takes a lot of uh, commitment on the patient's part to, to walk through that pain, but it really does work. Um, and it's important they get that ischemic pain. That seems to be very important for outcomes. So what about revascularization? When should you think about it? Well, most cases, endovascular first um, is an accepted strategy, but we have some new data that that's probably not true for every patient. Um, the things to consider include anatomy. Um, the interventionalists will use this task classification. I'll show you an example of what that is. That's a way to, to define how complex the procedure will be. You wanna keep in mind that your patency rates uh, decrease as you move down the limb. So in the aortoiliac area, you may actually revascularize up front because the patency rates are so good. Femoral popliteal, I would do it after they really fail a true trial of medical therapy. Below the knee, you don't send them for revascularization just for claudication, only for CLTI because the, the patency rates are so poor. This is an example of what the task classification looks like for the aerodiliac region, um, A to D, D being the most complex, and it's a way that the, the proceduralists use to identify how complex a procedure would be endovascularly and whether or not a patient maybe should get an open repair. They also will sometimes use this angiosome concept for our patients with wounds. The idea being um, that there's certain distributions of the limb that are perfused by specific arteries. So depending on where the wound is, they may target revascularizing that specific artery. Um, again, with the goal in CLTI being just to save the limb, not expecting that it's gonna stay open forever. What about surveillance? Um, so if your patient's symptoms are stable on follow-up, they say there's unclear benefit. I do it because again, patients don't always report accurately how limited they are. If your patient has new or worsening symptoms, you wanna get that physiologic testing to prove that they can't walk as far or they've got a new drop in their ABI. After revascularization, it's really a combination of physiologic testing and duplex ultrasound in follow-up. And duplex ultrasound can allow us to identify problems earlier, early. It's low risk, non-invasive. Here you can see there's a stent in the artery on the SFA. There's incomplete filling of the stent um, and there's a stenosis here. So I'll just remind you about what we talked about. We're getting now to my summary slides to remember when to use physiologic versus imaging and the evaluation of your patient. Remember the physiologic testing is gonna show you how the disease relates to your patient's presentation and how they're doing after therapy. Whereas the imaging will really allow you to identify therapeutic options and see the lesion itself. Um, you wanna make sure that you use diagnostic testing to identify patients early, remembering the ABI is the gold standard. 
Revascularization of the clodicin is really a turning point in their disease. Remember, those patients are gonna come back for repeat procedures and there's four times the risk for acute limb ischemia after revascularization. Our medical therapies are excellent at preventing cardiovascular and limb events. We need to prescribe them. And you can consider revascularization when your patient is limiting claudication despite true optimal medical therapy and exercise therapy above the knee. And in CLTI, it's first line to save the limb regardless of the disease level. That's your guideline directed medical therapy. And I thank you very much for your attention. Ah, great question. So the question is whether or not a controlled ABI is important in calculating the ABI. Um, and the answer is it, it doesn't matter because it's a ratio. Yeah. We have a question from uh, online. Yeah. The question online is... Um, I, un I understand the poverty risk in the black population is there a genetic component too? That's not entirely clear. Um, when they've looked at the genetics, it's, it does not account for all of it. That's the bottom line. It's a, it's a combination of factors. I think they're just starting to, um, but it's, it's an obvious need for sure. Um, there's been some in interesting data coming out of St. Luke's um, in Kansas City about potentially you know, food deserts and diets and how that might contribute, um, but I think it's gonna be very complicated. Another hot area potentially is um, you know, climate change, uh, use of additives to our foods, is that having an effect on things? Um, but it really is a wide open space. Could be, yeah. Um, that is one of the thoughts, um, particularly that there are not enough providers with expertise in those areas. Um, there's also um, some probably generational um, issues with this. So like, for example, patients considering that it's normal to lose your limb as you age because that's what they've seen in their family for years. Um, so I think it's, it's a, going to be an issue that needs to be attacked both on the provider side, but also on the patient education level. And that's what the PAD National Action Plan is trying to do. Yeah, that's a great question. So um, the question is, does it, does it change your approach if your patient has polyvascular disease, if they have CAD and PAD? Um, so with each added involvement of ath atherosclerosis in terms of vascular beds, your risk for events increases, so your ischemic risk goes up. Um, so it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily um, change my therapy in terms of the targets or therapies I'm trying to put patients on, except that if a patient has polyvascular disease, the benefit of low-dose uh, rivaroxaban and aspirin, for example, um, is probably higher because uh, I think their ischemic risk is higher, and so I'm less worried about the bleeding risk. I'll also usually target their LDL to less than 55 and just be really aggressive about getting their risk factors under control. I think that's terrifying <laughs> and fascinating. Um, so 
just last week or last week in New England Journal, they published a study looking at carotid plaque in patients. And they identified um, that patients that had microplastics or nanoplastics in the plaque had worse outcomes, cardiovascular outcomes over time. Um, so it's not necessarily causative, but it is very hypothesis generating and interesting that we're seeing this. I think to me, it kind of makes sense because there probably is um, a foreign body response in the body in, ter in terms of inflammation, et cetera, to that being around. Um, so, I mean, I think it's terrifying that they're finding that stuff in us now, um, but. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so someone's asking, uh, is dual treatment with low dose rivaroxaban and aspirin lifelong for PAD? Yeah, so it would be. It would be a chronic therapy. Um, the one thing I didn't mention before, but I will hear is that, you know, as much as I try to get my patients on this, I would say about 40% I can't because the copay is too high. Um, and so for those patients, clopidogrel monotherapy is what I would do. Thank you.